All right, I get the title of my sermon from John 13, that you love one another, that you love one another. So I want to talk about loving one another today. John 13, uh, we see there Jesus saying to his disciples, <clears throat> A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Right, so there's a few profound things there. You know, when Jesus says, you know, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another in the way that he loved us. I mean, if you think about how Jesus loves us, how he provides for us, he protects us, he sacrificed himself for us, he puts us before his own desires. I mean, he said in the garden to God, not my will but thine be done. That's what he was willing to do for us. But what are we willing to do for one another? I think sometimes when we read this verse, we have that, that lawyer moment who asks Jesus, but who is my neighbor? You know, I, may, I don't know if this one, this stretches as much as the principle of loving your neighbor as yourself because he's talking to his disciples, you know, but the disciples are to love one another as Jesus loved them. And what's interesting about this passage is he says here in verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So when you think on that verse, I mean, what should identify a Christian? What should identify a disciple of Jesus Christ? You say, oh, it's because they have the fish on the back of their car. You know, that, that, that fish, uh, that metal fish. Or you say, oh, it's because they wear like really loud Jesus t-shirts. You know, Jesus is my man or whatever. I don't know, like, well, you know, what do you think of when you think of a Christian? Is it the way they talk? Is it the way they dress? Is it the church that they go to? Is it what they believe? You know, we have different ideas of, you know, what should be the primary identifier of a Christian. And Jesus says, hey, this is how all men should know that you are one of my followers, right? If you're a Christian and you take the name Christian and you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, what should be the defining feature that makes people know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, or it's your love for Jesus' disciples, for his other brethren, right? How much you love your fellow Christians, right? So that should be the defining point, right? So how are you doing in that measurement when you think about yourself? How much do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, some Christians despise their brothers and sisters in Christ. They can't stand coming to church. They have too many conflicts in church, right? So we need to overcome that, right? We need to love one another. And that's what I'm talking about today. I'm talking to talk about five different ways that we can love one another. And uh, maybe you can implement some of these in your life if you're not already, or even to a, a greater extent. Look at what John, uh, Jesus says in John 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so that's the greatest uh, love that somebody can have. And it's, uh, this is like Jesus is calling to his disciples. This is the, it's the ultimate call to be absolutely selfless, right? That the love that he's saying for us, the love with one another, is that we really go last and to the point where, you know, we're willing to die for one another. And, and you can see, you know, I, I, can, I can understand like in, in the army, atmosphere, how those bonds become so strong because these men are like risking their lives for each other, protecting one another. And, you know, that's the sort of uh, environment that Christianity should be because we, we are, we're in a war as well, in a spiritual war. And this is why I believe that the people that serve together in ministry, you know, they, they form the closest bonds. You know, and sometimes you wonder, like, why, why are my bonds not as close in church? It's because you need to serve with one another. When you're in the spiritual battlefield together, that's when the strongest bonds are created. I think this verse also is, is very important why we understand that Jesus is not just a man, you know, he's not just the Son of God, that he is indeed God himself. Because, you know, if, if, you know, when you understand the Trinity, if you only believe that God the Father and God the Son are only two different persons, and that's it, then that means God the Father is sending somebody else to die for the sins of the world. But when you understand that that man, Christ Jesus, is also God himself, then God fulfills the greatest love, right? Because God himself stepped into the creation and died and showed this greatest love, right? And so this is why I think how we understand the Godhead is, is important as well when we are 
glorifying God's love for his creation, that he himself showed this love that Jesus is talking about, because Jesus is God. Well, what are some ways that we can love one another? Let's talk about five of those today. First one is to consider one another, to think about one another. Right? Hebrews 10 tells us, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Right? So you need to know one another, you need to meet one another in order to consider one another. But what I want you to understand here is, you know, church is more than just something on your spiritual to-do list. Right? So a lot of people grow up and church to them is just, they treat it like, like the Buddhist treats going to the temple. It's just like the things, they, they got to go and they got to go through their spiritual routine and I've done my spiritual checklist that makes me feel a bit more spiritual and I've fulfilled my obligation to God and then I go about my life. You know, that's not what church is meant to be. You know, church, a church is not just, you know, you can use the word church as this gathering here as we're all gathered to attention, but it's more than that. Right? Church is the, the body of people. It's the, it's the community here. So do you realize, do you understand what church is? That it isn't just this gathering. It isn't just a spiritual tick off on your to-do list. It's the people here. Right? That's why we assemble together because we form part of this community. And that's why the, the community, it, it works it's, like a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right, when you're part of a community because you're accountable to one another because you're known, right? But it also means when something goes wrong in your life, people know too, right? So, but this is how community works. You know, like if people don't want accountability in their life, they don't want to be known, they're not really rooted in that church. So whilst there's that side of church, but there's also the good side too, that when you're missing, people realise that you're gone. Right? When something goes wrong in your life, you have people there to support you. You have people there that care about you. So you know, it can be a double-edged sword sometimes with church. But the benefit, I believe, really outweighs you know, the cons of our sinful nature. Because you know? obviously, you know, when you're in, amongst sinful people, there's going to be conflict. Right? There's always going to be conflict there. But I believe the benefit outweighs the cons. And God wants us in a church for these reasons to assemble, to provoke unto love and to good works, to encourage one, one another. But what I'm talking about here is to consider one another. You know, do you think about other people at church? Do you realize that you're part of something bigger? You know, that you're part of this community? You know, a lot of people are very self-centered. They only think about themselves, right? When they come to church, they only think about how church benefits them. They don't come to church thinking, how can I be a benefit to somebody else? That's where you want to get to. Yeah, you may have started off as, hey, I'm searching for answers or I'm trying to meet some friends or I'm trying to, you know, get some spiritual fulfillment for myself. But then you grow beyond that and you start thinking, you know, I'm coming to church not just for me, I'm coming to church for others. You know, I'm coming to church because I want to encourage somebody else there today. I want to be a blessing to somebody else. I want to add to the environment because if I'm not there, I'm taking away from that environment. You know, I want to come to church and be a blessing to others and uh, have that mindset of, you know, being part of the body because you care about others and you, and you want to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, when you look around the room this morning, it's great you've got a, you know, a bigger crowd here this morning. When you look around the room, do you know everyone here? You know, you look around the room, do you know everyone's names? Do you know their life? Do you know what they do? Get to know one another. That's what I mean by consider one another. Sometimes when I'm talking to people in church and I'll be talking about somebody else and they're like, well, I don't know that person. You know, shame on you. You know, if you come to church, if you don't know somebody, go and introduce yourself. Go and sit next to them, say hello. You know, there shouldn't be any reason, especially with a church this small, you know, there shouldn't be any reason why you don't know everybody in this room. I mean, unless you're new, of course. You know, it takes some time to get to know them. But, you know, get some time, take some time to get to know everyone. Um, you know, you don't want church to be like, you know, I reflect on this, like, a, like when you take your kids to sport. And I've shared this story before. And maybe parents understand. You know, you take your kids to sport, you've got all the parents sitting along the side. And sometimes in some clubs, like, nobody's talking to one another. Like, everyone's just on their phones. 
Everyone's ignoring each other. I, I decided I didn't want to do that in my life. I, like when, I, when I take my kids to sport, if somebody sits next to me, I just introduce myself and I just talk and just, you know, and then you just get to know people. And uh, some, some clubs are a bit different to others. You know, some clubs you go to and nobody's talking to each other. And some, some places you take your kids, everyone knows each other. And that's, and that's a beautiful thing, right? The, the place where I go to jiu-jitsu is like that. You know, where it's, it really feels like a community. They do some events and everyone gets to know one another. We're all on the side. Everyone's talking and everyone's... And I think if we can breed that sort of culture here, that is, I think, a beautiful thing. So we don't want it to be like that. And, you know, don't be like that as well as a Christian when you go to places like that. I think as Christians, you know, we should be the ones reaching out to the world, if anything, you know, trying to be friendly, introduce yourself. And I, I find it's... It's, it's just that barrier. Like, it's so much easier just to sit there and just, like, mind your own business. But, you know, I found there's a lot of value. And, and, and I think this is when you're younger, you don't really appreciate, like, you know, just connections, just people you know, and just, like, meeting new people and just getting to know people. Um, but when I sit down at, like, jiu-jitsu or at soccer, like, if somebody sits next to me, I just say, hey, my name's Victor. And then that just starts coming. They'll introduce themselves and then... You know, if you're, if you're not that good at conversation, some people, some people are not that good at conversation, but I think it is a skill that you develop. You know, some people are a bit more uh, confident than others, so that helps. It's the same with soul winning. If you're a bit more confident, obviously that's going to help. But any sort of communication or conversation, it's a skill that you can learn. And, and, and I find the easiest way to do it is you just ask questions. You know, you just ask questions. So I might introduce myself. You start off with, hey, how long have your kids been coming? Oh, which one are your kids? And then and as they start to open up, it, it opens more questions. Right? So, then, so I, teach my, I try and teach Simon because you know, he's, he's uh, you know, trying to start conversations with the kids there and stuff, get to know them. And I say, look, you just ask a question, you make a comment about what they said, and then you ask another question. And you just repeat, and then eventually the conversation gets going, and then, then uh, you know, the people like talking to you. Um, Anyway, so that's, that's, that's good. And I, think, and I think Christians should be like that. You know, there's a song that goes, you know, give the world a smile each day, you know, helping someone on their way. You know, and I think as Christians, we should have that sort of mentality. You know, it's not just about preaching them the gospel. It's also just bringing some positivity in people's life, being a friendly person. And, you know, that's part of, I think, being a good testimony as a Christian. I think so many times, like, I've had people say to me, you know, oh, I, I knew you were, like, religious of some sort, you know, I knew you were a Christian, because if you're friendly and you're respectful, you know, you don't swear a lot, you know, you just, you stand out, you'll be different. So, consider, you know, that's what church, we don't want church to be like that, we don't want church to be where people don't talk to one another, we want it to be a friendly place where everyone knows each other, people want to get to know. Now, of course, you, you can't, when, when church grows, you can't get to know everyone. Right? But it's that mindset of outreach. You know, this mindset of outreach isn't just about soul winning. You know, and um, sometimes newer Christians, you know, they're, they're so passionate. I've seen examples in my life where people are very passionate about preaching the gospel and stuff. But then they get into conflicts with people at church. And I just feel like, look, our, our attitude of loving others to bring them the gospel is the same attitude we have with people in church, you know, like if a visitor comes, it's that same attitude of, I want to reach out to this person so that they can grow in Christ. You know, I want to build stronger friendships and relationships in the church because I want them to grow in the Lord. And sometimes, sometimes we lose sight of this outreach mentality, right? When churches lose sight of this outreach mentality, that's when you start getting the internal fights, right? And the, and the conflict and the bickering. Right? But when we have a common goal, we have a common enemy, we have a common faith, we, we, have a, we have a goal that is higher than just ourselves here, then people will tend to put those differences aside for a, for a greater cause. They, they, bind, they, they bond together for a greater cause. And then those smaller challenges in life tend to go by the wayside. So the same mentality we have with outreach, that we want to bring the gospel to people, it it's just flows on, it should flow on naturally to that how we welcome and we want to get to know people in church. So, do you consider one another? Do you notice if someone is not here? These are the sort of things to think about. Ephesians 4. And this responsibility is all of ours. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ 
from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working, and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All right, so do we consider one another? That's one way to love one another, is you think about each other. Number two, consider one another, is to learn more about one another. To learn more about one another. I talked about it a bit with, you know, how to have conversation, you know, is you get people talking, right? If you can ask them questions, you ask them, you know, more about themselves, then you learn. James 1.19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Right, so now, of course, you know, if you're going to get to know each other, somebody's got to be doing the talking, right? But, you know, what, what, where should the emphasis be? What should your mindset be? You want to hear first. Right, now, eventually, both of you have to talk to get to know one another. But swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. See, to learn about somebody, you've got to be willing to listen. You've got to be willing to understand, right? When I say listen to each other, understand one another. Right? So listen to understand. Don't just, like they say, don't just wait for your turn to talk. You know, and we, we're all guilty of that. I'm guilty of that too. You know, anybody who knows me, you know, Victor's guilty of that too. That sometimes you just try to, you want to say what you want to say. Right? And we have to remind ourselves to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to rap. So it's not just what they are saying that's important. You've got to think about why they're saying it too. Sometimes conflict happens because you don't always understand why people are saying it. You know, you jump to assumptions, right? So it's not just always the words that they use. You need to understand what do they mean by the words that they use. And being somebody who's listening, somebody who's ready to learn about somebody, you will hear first before you answer. And we'll look at a proverb on that later. We've all heard the saying, like, don't assume. How do you spell assume? You make an ass out of you and me, right? So you don't assume things. You want to listen, hear first. Proverbs 20, verse 6 Look at this, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. See, most people, they like to talk about themselves. So this is why it's, it's very easy to get to know people. If you just ask them about themselves, they like to talk about their life. They like to talk about themselves. That's just natural, right? And uh, this is how you can get to know people. When you ask them questions, you learn more about them. But, you know, we need to be careful not to speak too much. There's proverbs that warn against being too hasty with our words. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So, you know, if you've been into any sort of Christian debates, this verse comes up all the time. <laughs> any Christian that is arguing online, or I'm sure we've all quoted this at some point, you know, accusing you, hey, listen to my argument before you... Before you answer it, you know, before you jump to conclusions. But hey, whenever we hear Bible verses, we should always apply them to ourselves first, right? Make sure we answer a matter, you know, don't answer a matter before we hear it. And you know, if you listen to people before you answer, it might change either how you disagree with them, you know, it might, might change your opinion, but it also may change how you give advice. You know, if you don't really understand their situation, like some, you know, Younger Christians, they want to go around telling everyone else how to live. You know, they are like children. Like children do the same, right? Children want to go around telling everyone else how to live, and they, don't, they got things that they need to work on, right? So it's the same here. You may change how you give advice if you're willing to hear first before you answer. Um, and you just won't, you, you won't just assume the worst of people, right? It's always good to understand people's point of view before you give advice or before you state your case. Proverbs 27, verse 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. All right, so that one is learn more about one another. You know, be more ready to hear, right, than to, to speak. And um, that will help you love one another because you want, you, the more you know about them, the more you can help them. And this leads on to number three, right? So you, first you've got to consider one another. Number two is know one another, you know, learn about each other, and that requires listening, that requires conversation, so that, number three, you can more effectively pray for one another. So you can more effectively pray for one another. Ephesians 1 says here, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, 
cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You know, this is why you, you see in Paul's letters, he's such a great example, where you know, he was not only zealous in good works, but he prayed, for his, he prayed for his brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, he's writing them a letter and he's saying to them that, you know, in, in others he says, well, God is my witness, how I long for you all. You know, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So these are the sort of things he prayed for, for the Ephesians here. He wanted them to grow in wisdom, that God would bless them. Jesus says, praying for others. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So it's an interesting prayer, and it's a, it's a prayer that, um, uh, you know, a request that I think probably many church leaders can relate to, where, you know, they, they, they're praying that their people will see God the way, the way they see God. You know, it's like, and I think that we always hope that, you know, when we, when we go out and preach the gospel, you're always hoping that people see your point of view, that they see things the way you see them. And I think this is what Paul is saying here to the Ephesians, is that I, I, I'm praying that you see God the way I see God, and hopefully that will motivate, that will open your eyes to serve him and to love him as Paul loves him. You know, and, and I think that's something we wish for the, you know, our Christian brothers and sisters, something we wish for our children as well, that they, that they would be, that their spiritual eyes would be open, that, that they will see God the way that he should be seen. Um, so when we pray for one another, uh, a tip here is, you know, don't, don't depend on your memory. You know, everyone should have a personal prayer list. You know, a prayer list that you have. So when somebody shares a prayer request with you, you know, write it down. And then that way when you spend some time in prayer, you have a way to remind yourself like what people's prayer requests are. Right? And you can even copy their church prayer list as well. Right? So don't depend on your memory. It's good to write people's prayer requests down so you don't forget. And then you have things to pray for. You'd be surprised if you keep a sort of journal or keep a record of what to pray for people you know, how many things that there really are to pray for, the people that you know. So even our church list is so, it's so long. That's why I split it up into four things that we pray for something different every week because the, the list is quite long. So that's Ephesians 1. Philippians 1, look here in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. So we saw in Ephesians, he wanted you know, their eyes to be open. And in Philippians here, he's praying that, that they'll grow in the faith, that they'll go on to do great things, that they'll, they'll abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. You see how he's praying for the spiritual well-being of his brothers and sisters in Christ? He wants them to grow. He wants them to do greater things than he even did that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offence. So he's praying for their, for their spiritual purity as well. Right? So he wants them to live a godly and clean life, sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So a couple of things here. We saw here some of the things he's praying for them. And we see here, what I like about this passage is that he talks about Jesus Christ doing a work in them. He's begun a good work in you and will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But the reason why he has this confidence is because he's praying for them. See, it's meet for me to think this of you. He's saying it's suitable for me to think that Jesus Christ is working in you and will perform it until he returns. Why? Because I have you in my heart. And this verse has always resonated with me when I think about praying for others, that you know, we need to be reminded that when we pray for one another, it does make a difference. 
Like Paul is saying here, it, it, will, it, it, it makes a difference in other people's lives if you besiege God on their behalf. Right? So don't think it's vain when you pray for others because Paul didn't believe it was vain. Paul was confident that God would work in their life because he prayed for them. And, and look at how much he prayed. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. Okay? Last one I want to share in this section on praying for one another. Second Thessalonians 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and, and wicked men, for all men have not faith. <laughs> I just, I didn't, I didn't realize this in the, in the verse when I put it in there. But I just, uh, the thought I just had there is like, oh, even, even Paul thinking, guys, that he's uh, arguing with, like, are irrational and unreasonable. You know, <laughs> I always feel that. But the point I'm making here is that second, second, second Thessalonians 3 is we want to pray for one another, but also don't be shy to mention your prayer requests. You know, ask for prayer too. You know, people want to pray for you, but then, you know, if you're, you know, too sick, obviously they're I'm not saying there aren't sensitive things and not sensitive things. But, you know, you need to be willing to share some prayer requests so people can pray for you. Right? So they know what to pray for. Um, and here, Paul, you know, Paul, if you read his epistles, he was, he, he made his prayer requests quite clear. I mean, he's writing them in an epistle for all to read. But I think one of the reasons why we have these scriptures in the Word of God is because it's an example to us to, to not be too shy about letting our brothers and sisters know what to pray for, right? And, and, and to ask for prayer. There's nothing wrong to ask for prayer. It's not just about just praying for others. I mean, think about it. You can only pray for others because they've shared with you their prayer requests, right? So it works both ways. All right, number four. Number four, we don't want our love to just stop at just words, just prayer, right? We want to do. The way we can love one another is we actually do things for one another, right? Number four. So John, 1 John 3, verse 16, says, By hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Right? So see, if our love is only in thought and in word, that's not enough. Right? That's not what God expects from us. He wants us to put actions to our words. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Right? So we want to do something nice for one another. That's how we can love. We actually put our, our, our words into action. Right? So how do you know their needs if you don't know anything about them? So this is why I have them in this order. Right? So it's like a natural progression. We've got to consider one another. Right? We've got to learn about one another. That allows us to then pray for one another. But we don't want it to just stop at prayer. We, want to, we can have the ability right, to do something about it. Like in verse 17. Whoso hath this world's goods. So if you have the ability to help somebody and then you see one of your brothers or sisters in Christ have need and then you don't help them, he's saying, what sort of love is that? That's not the love of God in you. If you have the ability to help somebody and then you don't, right? So you need to know what people's needs are. No, you need to get to know them. You know, it might be buying somebody, buying something for somebody. It might be making them food. It might be helping them with something, right? Helping them here. Um, this one, it may be just including them. You know, we, we what we don't want in church. You know, you know, how people always say this in churches. They had their own cliques. And that's what happens when groups get a bit bigger, right? Groups, groups, churches get a bit bigger. People find the groups that they're comfortable with, which is, which is good, right? You'll kind of gravitate towards people that maybe you associate with better. But you never want to just form a clique where you're just comfortable. That's just your group. And then you guys, you never say hello to anyone else. You never include anyone else, right? So I always, it's always great when I hear about you know, people doing something and then they invited somebody that was new to church or they, invite, they reached, you know, reached across the aisle and they invited others. You know, they reach and say, hey, where we're we going to this, come with us. 
And this is one way that those bands in church get stronger, right? those relationships get stronger. So we're considering one another and we invite them out, you know, maybe have them over for dinner. You know, you're making an effort. It's a, it's a proactive effort. You know, we all know that relationships takes effort. That's why as we grow older, sometimes it's harder to keep up with all these relationships. But we've got to put some work in. We can't just give up and just say, oh, you know, well, I know enough people, right? Just, you just do as much as you can, right? You do as much as you can just to get to know, increase that network that you have, right? And that influence that you have to, to be a blessing to others. First John 4. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So what I want you to take from this verse is, you can't hate your brother and say you love God. Right? And your love for your brethren is a reflection of how much you love God. Right? So when you think about how much do I love God, see, there are ways you can measure your love for God. See, sometimes people just measure their love for God, just how they feel about God. Just think like, oh man, I'm just, mm, like I'm feeling even more love for God. That's how I measure my love for God. No! Like, how do you measure how much you love God? Well, you, there's very practical ways you can measure that, right? Like, how much, how much do you love prayer? How much do you love church? How much do you love reading your Bible? How much do you love seeing your brothers and sisters in Christ? How can you say you love God when you don't even want to spend time with God's people, with God's body? I said, this is how you measure. Like, how much do I love God? How much do I love keeping God's commandments? Well, that's another way. So these are the practical ways you measure your love for God. It's not just how you feel. Now, how you feel can come and go. If you feel that you love God more than other times, that's going to make following God easier. But that's not the determining factor of how much you love God because, you know, what is emotion without action, right? It's like, what's words without action? Now, the last one we'll talk about quickly, doing things, is, is your example. Right? How can you love one another? Well, one way you can love one another is by the example that you set. Because right? not only will you encourage or discourage others, you set a good example, you set a bad example, but also your, it's, it's your impact on that person's family and their life as well. Like if I love somebody else, I don't want to discourage them from walking in the Lord. I don't, I don't want to discourage them from living a godly life. I want to encourage them. I need to push them in the right direction. But if my example is pushing them in the wrong direction, how, how am I being a loving example to this person? And, um, you know, you reflect on this more as you have children and your children grow up and you start to see others in church rubbing off on them, right? You know, and they, they look up to others. They, you know, because, you know, children, they learn from their parents, yes, but they also learn from their friends. They also learn from other adults in the church. Right? So one way you can be a blessing and you can love one another in this church and be a, is to be a great example. Right? Be a God-fearing, zealous, knowledgeable, respectful. You know, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you interact with one another, your, your example and how you serve, that's also a way you're going to love somebody else. And, you know, I definitely appreciate it. And I'm sure those of you who have young children as well would appreciate it too. You know, when you come to church, you have godly examples. That's one way you can love the body. Right? 1 Timothy 4, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So all these different areas of our life. Being an example. It doesn't matter how young or old we are. We can all set a good example, and that's one way we can love one another. You know how we serve? I like to share this. And I've, I've said it multiple times in church, but, you know, we, we serve with joy. You know, how, what does that mean? We serve Jesus first, others second, and you last. We want that servant mentality like we talked about a few weeks ago. Now, like I said, love isn't just an emotion, right? So part of being a good example is keeping God's commandments. Right? Look at what it says in 2 John 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. 
This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So your example to others should be an example of keeping God's commandments, an example of encouraging others to keep God's commandments. Right? That's how you love one another. First John 5, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Look at this. And his commandments are not grievous. So remember I talked about practical ways to think about how much you love God? Well, here is another way, right? What do you think of God's commandments? Are you always complaining about what God expects of us? Or do you say, do you understand why these are good and you seek to try and fulfill them? This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous, right? So we want to provoke unto love and good works, you know, and we, if we are a good example, then we will be a blessing to each other in church. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 16. Paul says here, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Archaea, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Look at this, look at this sort of language that Paul uses here. Right, that he's commending, like, you know, you know, sometimes we say, oh man, those guys are way too into this, this church stuff, you know, people will say things, say things like that. I mean, that sort of attitude was commended by Paul. Look at them, they have addicted themselves to the ministry. Usually that word is used where, you know, people can't get off the drugs, they can't get off the alcohol, they can't get off the coffee. Right? They say, I'm addicted. You know, they wake up and they're just not themselves unless they do that. That's what we should be like with things of the faith. Right? They've addicted themselves to the ministry, that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us in labor. I am glad at the coming of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. So this just goes to show, I mean, look at Paul. You think Paul, he loved God, he knew what God was like, zealous, Hey, but even Paul needed to pick me up every now and then. And you know what picked Paul up? The encouragement from others. The example from others. Those addicted to the ministry, they were refreshing to him. So you see how like we, the way we go about our Christianity can really have an impact on the body of Christ and what this church does. Your zeal for God's work is going to change. It can revolutionize our church. Right? So they don't discount that. How you, how the sort of Christian you are, right? And I, and I believe we're like coals in a fire. You know, the more of us that are burning bright, it's like when you blow oxygen onto the fire, it just burns brightly. That's what we want our church to be. And all of us have to play a part. I can't do this by myself, guys. You know, like one coal burning in that lump of coal is not enough, right? You can get the fire going, but if we really want it roaring hot, we need more of us going hard. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, toward all saints. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. You know, so even though Paul is writing this to Philemon, wouldn't you want God to say this about you? you know, we always say when we end our life, I'd love God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, I also want God to say this about me. He said, we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. All right, so these are five ways that we can love one another, right? We, can, we need to consider one another. You know, we want to learn about one another. We want to pray for one another. You know, put our actions, put, put, our, put actions to our prayers and then be a good example. All right, and the last thing I want to just end on here, I want to give you one closing thought, is the way that we should love. You know, I'll just read here from Luke 6, and this is the thought, last thought I want to share. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of who you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as, such, as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, 
hoping for nothing. Hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So what I want to encourage you on this last thought is, it's, you know, it's really easy to love people that you like. Right? But the, re- the real test of love that God wants us to have is how much do you love those that you may not like, right? that may not be appreciative of what you do, right? that may, you, know, you may get nothing in return, that may not be grateful. But God is saying, no, those are the people that really test your love right? because it's easy to love people that love you but it's a lot more difficult to love the way Jesus loved. Remember how he said, as I have loved you? So the disciples even sometimes thought. But Jesus told them, no, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And that's in this way. This is how Jesus loved. He loved sinners. And we ought to do the same. All right, so we need to have this Christ-like love. And hopefully you can apply some of these principles in your life. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, uh, thank you for the reminder to have a love like you love. We learn different ways today to, to love one another. Help us, Lord, to implement these things in our life. Help us not to walk away the same person we came today. And Lord, help us to love as you love. Help us to love those even if we do not receive the same love back. So we thank you, Lord, that you were the, the ultimate example. Help us to be a good example for your sake and for the people here. Uh, We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.